to get started. So welcome to those of you who have joined. Uh, my name is Michelle LaRue. I, my pronouns are she, her, and I am joining you all from Treaty 6 territory in Edmonton, Alberta. And a couple of, I guess, a wee bit about me. I, uh, my educational background is psychology. I am the family violence specialist for the Alberta Home Visitation Network and have been in this role since uh, 2015. And also for the past just over one year, uh, my full-time primary hat is actually a uh, manager with the Edmonton Police Service in our equity, inclusion and human rights branch. So that is just a little bit about me. And I'm excited to be here with you all today talking about um, family violence and cultural safety. So I have a very um, ambitious uh, presentation to share with you. And if you haven't yet filled out the poll, please go into the polls um, tab and fill it out. I'm just trying to get a gauge of, um, for those participants who are here, your knowledge about cultural safety and also your knowledge of family violence just so that I have an idea of where I should focus the majority of my time today. So thank you for those of you who um, are filling that out. So just to get us started, here we go. Uh, a bit about our objectives today. So as I mentioned, we're gonna be focusing on understanding cultural safety and understanding family violence. I'm going to learn um, about the importance of having a culturally safe practice. And I will also share with you a tool uh, that can help us to reflect upon our biases and our assumptions and uh, really support a culturally safe practice. And again, this can be utilized working with any client, but uh, definitely is relevant when we're also working with individuals who are impacted by family violence. And I will also very briefly share a little bit about the CASA project, uh, which is essentially how this all came to be for, which is uh, the organization I'm representing, the Alberta Home Visitation Network Association. All right. So a little bit about who AVNA is. Uh, AVNA, as I mentioned, is the Alberta Home Visitation Network Association. It is a provincial uh, body, a not-for-profit society made up of members, and the membership is really all home visitation programs or programs that have home visits within the spectrum of the work that they offer and do. And AVNA is really there to support its membership in providing training and networking uh different research and evaluation resources uh, we have network meetings and various kind of um, training opportunities throughout uh, the year some of it some of it is in person some of it is online but it is all really to support uh, best practice in uh, home visitation so that's a little bit about avna so looking at what we're going to do in the time that we have together today, we're going to start with looking at some family violence information and definition statistics and really doing a bit of a dive into the various types of abuse, some barriers that folks might uh, encounter when wanting to disclose or potentially leave uh, an abusive relationship. And then we'll talk a bit about cultural safety. And as I mentioned, I will briefly just go over the CASA project um, since it is the CASA project that really informed a lot of the work that AVNA is currently doing in this space. So to get us started, uh, because I am here representing AVNA and a lot of the content is related to a protocol that was developed, as I mentioned, I have been with AVNA since 2015, at which time I joined them as a contractor. They hired me as a contractor to write and develop a family violence protocol for all home visitation programs in our province, in the province of Alberta. So just to get a little bit of a sense of what that protocol is, uh, this family violence protocol, as I said, for all home visitation programs in the province, it is rooted in best practice and it really is there to provide a consistent consistency, I guess, for all programs and home visitors who are working with individuals who might be impacted by family violence. So home visitors are going into the home primarily working around child family interactions, um, child development, and it is a unique opportunity for home visitors to actually screen for family violence and support those who might be impacted by it. So the family violence protocol has three different types of screens that we present and train home visitors on. So there's a universal screening, a reactive screen, as well as a pregnancy screen. The universal screen being best practice is really where every individual that encounters a home visitor or is a part of a home visitation program is screened for uh, family violence. And then included in the protocol also are various supports, additional information to support somebody who's impacted by or experiencing abuse in their relationship. 
And we also offer additional tools to support from when somebody does have a disclosure. So if that's, uh, we have a family violence screening form and we also train around uh, doing safety plans and responsibility planning because the protocol is not only to identify individuals who may be using or experiencing abuse in their relationship, but also those who may be using abuse. And that's where the responsibility plans come in. There may also be times where a home visitor actually encounters or works with somebody who is both experiencing abuse and also using abuse for example they might be experiencing abuse by their intimate partner but they may be using abuse um, towards their children and so in those cases we equip folks to be able to respond to both um, both of those experiences all right so let's get into a bit of uh, understanding and information about family violence itself I want to talk briefly about terminology. Uh, you will hear me use family violence, domestic violence, uh, somewhat interchangeably. Sometimes people, when they speak of domestic violence, they are intending or speaking specifically about people who are cohabitating in the same household. Uh, but oftentimes family violence, domestic violence is used interchangeably. And oftentimes what we're actually talking about is intimate partner violence. Uh, our protocol, this protocol that I've developed and the information that I'm gonna be sharing with you today around family violence is primarily focused on intimate partner violence even though I oftentimes will just use the term family violence or domestic violence as an umbrella term. So I just wanted to give that um, kind of disclaimer about the language that I will be using in today's session. So the definition that I tend to use when I'm educating or training around family violence was adapted from our community initiatives against family violence. And so it describes family violence as a systematic pattern of abusive behaviors within a relationship that is characterized by intimacy, dependency, and or trust. Abusive behaviors exist within a context where their purpose is to gain power and control and to induce fear. So that really is the definition. Sometimes when I have people uh, who will ask me or present, well, this is happening in my relationship, or this is what I've noticed in the clients that I'm working with, is this abuse? I oftentimes need more context, but I often will refer back to this definition and understanding that it is a systematic pattern, right? And where the purpose again is around power and control and to induce fear. Oftentimes, and I'll speak kind of within general society, it is understood that or thought that abuse, family violence is about physical abuse, when in reality, it is much more than that. So abusive behaviors, can include physical abuse, but there are many abusive relationships that exist that never will have the presence of physical abuse. Uh, so many of the other forms that we'll talk about, about today is verbal abuse or psychological, emotional abuse, sexual abuse, spiritual abuse, uh, cultural abuse, economic or financial abuse, uh, violation of rights and exploitation through neglect. And the protocol that, uh, that I use and that in the training that I do, we also include immigration abuse uh, as one of the types of abuse to be aware of and to consider. So there is, I just kind of want to dispel the myth that family violence is an anger management problem. Uh, if we think about what anger management is, if somebody has an anger management problem, if we, um, it is somebody who has problems or difficulty managing their anger, which would suggest somebody who is engaging in road rage or has a lot of conflict in their workplace or with colleagues, um, sometimes even with friends or, you know, broad, broadly speaking, family. Uh, whereas when we're talking about family violence or intimate partner violence, it is very targeted behavior. Uh, it's very common to hear people who speak about somebody will see this in media. Often, if there's been a domestic homicide, somebody has murdered their intimate partner and we hear it, we're like, oh, had no idea this person was such a stand up person in community. They were really well um, regarded uh, community you know, individual, give back to community, nice person, all of these types of things. And yet when we're talking about what's happened, I'm going to kind of go quote behind closed doors. Um, there it's targeted abusive behavior um, towards a person that they say that they love. So not an anger management problem. Uh, I wanted to just show, and I know there's a lot of text on a couple of these slides. This is really just some Canadian statistics. This is from 2021, looking at StatsCan. Uh, what we've seen in those most recent statistics that are published is that there has been an increase in police reported rates of family violence for five, five consecutive years. And we know that any individual, regardless of gender, um, race, 
so on and so forth, socioeconomic status, um, sexuality, may experience abuse in their relationship. Here I'm going to speak specifically about gender. We know that uh, it is not only women and girls or women identified individuals who experience abuse in their relationship, but we do know that this is a gendered issue. So if we look at two thirds of family violence victims, according to stats cans of the police reported, 69% um, were uh, women and girls. And this rate was two times higher um, than it was for men and boys. So just a little bit more to look at here. Um, again, this is looking specifically at intimate partner violence. Again, where we see that eight in 10, uh, so 79% of victims here are women and girls. Again, much, much higher than it is for men and boys. And again, looking at the 2021 statistics, this was the seventh consecutive year of a gradual increase in police reported rates of um, intimate partner violence. So definitely a concerning trend that we see um, taking shape. So I want to talk a little bit about uh, intimate partner violence specifically. And I think when we talk about understanding family violence, intimate partner violence, uh, and we're supporting individuals who might be impacted by that, it's important to have an understanding of what the various types of abuse are and what they can look like. Again, there definitely is typically an understanding of what physical violence looks like in a relationship, and that tends to be what people assume uh, we mean by intimate partner violence or family violence, that it's about phys physical abuse. And yet it's really important to understand that abuse can take many forms, as I mentioned. So I'm just very um, kind of, I'm going to say quickly, uh, go through what each one of these types of abuse might look like, just to, to give uh, surface awareness at the very least of the different types of abuse that can exist within a relationship. First and foremost, I'll start with psychological or emotional abuse, because oftentimes this is what is prevalent in a relationship in the absence of physical abuse, even with physical abuse present, psychological or emotional abuse is typically always the type of abuse that is present, um, usually not in the absence of others uh, within a relationship. And you can imagine that a relationship that is characterized by abuse does not start as being physically abusive, right? If I go out on a first date with somebody and during that date, that person, you know, punches me in the face, um, I'm not going on a second date, right? So that is not how this starts. And oftentimes it is extremely subtle in the early stages of a relationship. And so it starts with psychological abuse. So psychological, emotional abuse, if we look at a, a, just a broad definition of that, uh, it is deliberate, calculated infliction of mental or emotional anguish. And as you can imagine, this really erodes the self-esteem of the individual who is experiencing that, oftentimes leading them to doubt their own abilities and self-worth. So I will show or give a couple of examples of what psychological or emotional abuse can look like. Oftentimes what comes to mind for folks is verbal abuse, right? It's that name calling, put downs, um, berating of an individual. Isolation falls in the realm of psychological and emotional abuse where somebody is, is um, not allowed to interact with family and friends, uh, engage in activities socially with others, um, things like monitoring cell phones, this all falls within the realm of isolation. Isolation can also be geographic isolation. For example, where somebody might, um, you know, an abusive partner may decide that they are suddenly moving to another city where the individual doesn't have any connections or no individuals, or even moving to a rural or remote area uh, where, again, they are further isolated from um, family, friends, uh, community, um, sometimes employment as well. Manipulation, so really this is around using guilt, um, fear, shame. This all falls under the realm of manipulation, using children as pawns. Um, threats also fall in this category of psychological and emotional abuse. And here, this could be threats of harm, threats of harm to the, the person that they, you know, their intimate partner, if you will. It could also be threats of harm to pets, um, threats of harm to other family members within a context of looking at immigration abuse that we'll talk about um, shortly. It could be threats of harm to family members back home uh, in country of origin, if you will. This could also include, um, so threats of homicide, uh, it could also include uh, threats of suicide. So for the person who is using this behavior, this abusive behavior would threaten to, I'm going to kill myself if you do not do as I 
as I say, um, and it is again rooted in power and control. Important to understand that when we talk about threats of suicide in the context of family violence, it is not the same as an individual who is suicidal in the realm or scope of um, you know, clinical depression or mental health. Okay? Uh, intimidation, I'm um, using guilt, fear, or shame, as I've already mentioned. Uh, gaslighting, some of you may be familiar with that term. Gaslighting sometimes equated to uh, the concept of crazy making. Uh, it's really having, um, challenging a person to the point where that individual is questioning their own reality or what they know to be true. Uh, and jealousy, so constant uh, accusations of um, affairs of cheating, these types of things also fall here. Some of what we know to be our key factors or our risk factors around domestic homicide actually fall in psychological abuse. Uh, so some of the ones that I've already mentioned are um, threats of suicide, um, obviously um, threats of homicide, but threats of suicide and jealousy are, are two of our key risk factors around domestic homicide. So financial abuse, financial abuse, again, if we're just looking at a broad definition, this is uh, the controlling of funds or property, again, through force, uh, manipulation, fraud, um, trickery. So if we look at this within the context of the, uh, an intimate partner relationship, usually it is that one person controls and has power and control over all the finances. And oftentimes the person who is experiencing abuse is, uh, is even not aware of the financial situations, uh, is not allowed to make any decisions, and sometimes does not even have knowledge about the family income. This means that an individual, uh, even though they are working, might not actually have access to any of that income. Uh, it's all going to an account that you know, the person who's using abuse controls and makes decisions about. Oftentimes in the dynamics of an intimate partner relationship, financial abuse, the person who is using abuse, again, things that would be assets or creating assets are in that individual's names, where things that would create debt would be in, um, typically in the name of the person who is experiencing the abuse. And I know that I'm just kind of broadly touching on these types of abuse. Uh, there's, we really could do a fairly significant deep dive into what each one of these look like. But this is really just to give us a sense of the different types of abuse and how they might present or look in a relationship. So immigration abuse. Here we could think about things um, that an individual might experience if they're a newcomer to Canada, if they've been sponsored, or really regardless of their status. Um, could be around threats of deportation, uh, destroying immigration papers, uh, refusing to file necessary paperwork for, you know, child custody or naturalization. Uh, oftentimes in immigration abuse, we see uh, the use of children as pawns, threats of, of um, harm to children, things like um, threats of sending children again back to country of origin. Uh, it could also be not allowing somebody to access settlement supports or language services in, you know, so I'll speak here within my context of, of Edmonton or Alberta. So somebody who has as a newcomer here and their partner is not allowing them to access settlement services or not allowing them to learn the language uh, or insofar as accessing like link uh, language instruction for newcomers to Canada or ESL classes, access settlement supports. Um, it could also be even providing inaccurate false information about uh, an individual's rights and responsibilities uh, in, in Canada in this context. These are just some examples. Things would also be even use of dowry as um, a means of abuse as well. So spiritual abuse, again, this is regardless or irregardless, I guess, of the faith of the individual. Immigration or spiritual abuse can be thought of as uh, not allowing an individual to engage in their spiritual faith activities or with their faith community or spiritual community, or to force an individual to engage in behaviors that would go against the norms or against their spiritual beliefs. Oftentimes we'll see folks who will misuse scripture to support abusive behavior. So, for example, um, somebody who might say that their their you know um, sacred scriptures, whether it be the Bible, the Quran, um, says that they can right that their abuse is justified. And then, if we think about forcing somebody to engage in behaviors that go against, you know, it could be forcing a Catholic woman to have an abortion or forcing a Muslim woman to eat pork, things where they feel that they actually cannot go back to that spiritual connection that they had. Oftentimes when I think about spiritual abuse, I think about 
you know, autobiographies I've read or uh, interviews that I've listened to where people are speaking about their own experiences of trauma. And oftentimes they are asked, right, or the question comes up of like, what got you through? What kept you going? And the thing that people oftentimes will speak about is their spiritual connection, um, that connection around prayer or deity create or whatever that connection is for them. And I think spiritual abuse uh, is really about um, degrading or um, that innermost core of where people turn to when they feel that there's nowhere else for them to turn to. Uh, so it really impacts an individual's, again, sense of hope, right, where they really feel hopeless and helpless within their situation. Um, cultural abuse is another one to be aware of, and I talk about this a little bit more when we get to speaking about cultural safety, but it's important for, for me just to mention that when we take it, think about culture, oftentimes people automatically equate culture to ethnicity, as though we are only ever talking about ethnoculture. And yet culture is much, much broader than ethnicity. Uh, we can think about culture about any, any individual or a group, I guess, where we have um, cultural norms, right? A group of people who have those cultural norms. So when we talk about cultural abuse, it could be about ethnicity. It could be about, um, you know, somebody who's part of the 2S LGBTQ plus community. Uh, you know, I had a colleague who worked, did a lot of work within the disability community or the deaf community and spoke about the cultural norms within that community. So when we think about cultural abuse, very similar to spiritual abuse, right? There is a lot of um, intersection here where it's not allowing somebody to engage with or participate within their cultural group or cultural activities or to force uh, behavior that is contrary to that. Other things that we can see around cultural abuse, I uh, have forced marriage, honor-based violence, or threatening to out the person. If we're thinking within the context of the queer community, this is a huge method of control uh, within a relationship as well. Sexual abuse. So sexual abuse, again, uh, more broadly speaking as a definition, we can understand sexual abuse to be any unwanted or non-consensual. And when I talk about consent, I speak about voluntary consent. So any unwanted or non-consensual sexual behaviors or contact through use of force, coercion, exploitation. And of course, this list is not um, comprehensive, but it could include things like forcing sexual behaviors with others, um, forcing sexual behavior with self, so the person who is using abuse, uh, and any type of sexual behavior or contact, uh, forced exposure to pornography, forcing somebody to mirror or mimic what they're watching in pornography, tampering with birth control, so whether that's not allowing somebody to have access to birth control, um, flushing, you know, birth control pills down the toilet, poking holes in condoms, uh, or, or the opposite of that, right? Um, denying privacy. For, so an example of that would be a client I worked with who um, the, the individuals, well, there was no doors on the inside of the, the home, if you will. So there was no privacy around toileting, um, dressing, anything like that. So that would be another example uh, that we can include in sexual abuse. And then physical abuse is, of course, the one that people typically uh, understand or default to when we think about what abuse can look like in relationships. And physical abuse, again, I won't spend much time here, it really is any action that causes physical discomfort, pain, or injury. The only ones that I'll highlight here that sometimes we don't think about or necessarily understand as being a part of physical abuse or some that we really need to pay attention to. So denying access to food, medical care, shelter, clothing, which we would also would see under the umbrella of neglect, if you will, is also a form of physical abuse. Um, threats with a weapon. Uh, here, when we talk about weapon, it could be using any object as a weapon. Confinement uh, also falls under physical abuse. Uh, medication abuse. So when we talk about elder abuse, medication abuse is actually its own category of type of abuse. But Within this context, medication abuse can occur in any at any age, and whether that's over medicating somebody, um, even so that they're, they're in a sedentary state, let's say, or um, not allowing somebody to have access to needed medication. And then the last one that I want to just mention, which is on the slide here that you're seeing, is strangulation or choking. I And choking, I only keep it there because it's oftentimes the language that our clients would be using, um, but or, or individuals in, in community would be using. But really, we understand that what they're actually meaning is that they are being strangled, which is that external pressure versus choking when there is actually something lodged and blocking an airway. 
Uh, strangulation is also one of our risk factors around domestic homicide and oftentimes minimized by an individual who is um, experiencing abuse in their relationship. So it is one also to really pay attention to if you're working with somebody who is experiencing that. Uh, if anybody's interested in more information about any of these things that I'm talking about, uh, feel free. I will share my contact information at the end of the presentation to send me an email. Uh, for example, around strangulation, there's some really interesting research being done out of British Columbia, uh, looking at the impact of um, well, strangulation, but more broadly speaking, traumatic brain injury and domestic violence and intimate partner violence. So of course, we understand that a traumatic brain injury or a TBI can occur um, from strangulation, but many other aspects of domestic violence or intimate partner violence, uh, when we're seeing things like shaking, um, uh, violent shaking, pushing down stairs and these types of things. So if you're interested in further research about that, uh, please reach out to me and I'm happy to share additional information about um, any of these um, topics. All right, so stalking, or as we know it in our uh, Canadian legislation known as criminal harassment, is really just a persistent ongoing um, communication when it is unwanted and so for some this can actually occur within the context of an intimate partner relationship that is current uh, somebody can be stalked by an existing partner or somebody can also be experiencing stalking from a, a relationship that they have left and that could be just sending of gifts or um, you know messages, uh, ongoing phone calls. Uh, oftentimes when we think about stalking, it is um, it is the message that I, I know where you are and I can have access to you no matter what time of day it is or where you are. Uh, there is interesting stalking typography that has been done and one of the types of stalkers, like we can think about uh, the five different typographies, one being, for example, celebrity stalkers that we might hear about, but they've identified when looking at stalking typography that the intimate partner stalker is actually the most dangerous of all the types of stalkers. And when we think about why that might be, and I, I say most dangerous as an ending in homicide, Side, because who knows one best um, or better than their intimate partner, right? So somebody who knows, I'll speak about it in, in um, just I statements, just because it is for ease. So who knows better um, the routes that I take to work, what my work schedule is, where I shop, the way that I think in order to create passwords um, for my phones, for my, my banking, all of these types of things. But who knows me better than my intimate partner? So if you are, again, working with somebody who is experiencing stalking, especially if they have left a relationship and are, are experiencing post-separation abuse or stalking from a uh, past partner, some of the things that we can do to support is, well, documentation is certainly one of them, but one is, again, things like changing the routes that they take to work, um, making sure that they're, they're uh, you know, even walking around their vehicles um, prior to getting into it, making sure that you're closing the garage door prior to entering or getting out of the vehicle, all of these types of things. Again, there's some great tools that have been created um, to help support. So if you're interested in looking for more information around um, stocking, uh, I will put a couple of these, these things in the chat as well for you to reference. But there's an individual by the name of Julie S. Lalonde who has a great website called Out of the Shadows, as well as um, a video that she's created to help um, support women who are experiencing um, stalking. So I'll pop those in the chat kind of uh, near the end of the presentation. Okay, so I want to spend a little bit of time, again, briefly looking at some of the barriers that folks might encounter in so far as when they're experiencing abuse in a relationship in either disclosing, uh, sharing that information with friends, family, service providers, professionals, or also to even consider leaving a relationship. Also, if anybody has questions, please feel free to pop them into the chat as we go. Uh, I, um, it certainly will be helpful to see those and I'll try to answer them uh, as we go along. So some of the barriers, there are many, many, again, this, you know, the next couple slides are not, um, you know, there's many more than what is here, but for some, it may be their, it's just what is normal, it's very normalized for them. So for some individuals who may find themselves in an abusive relationship, they also grew up in an abusive, in an abusive home, right? Their family of origin, there was abuse in the home, and now they find themselves again in an abusive relationship themselves. Oftentimes people won't disclose or reach out or even leave a relationship because of fear, 
right? And that fear is deeply rooted in fear of many things. It could actually be fear for their own safety, right? Um, after having ongoing threats about their own safety if they were to leave, that is, you know, one of those roots of fear or fear of harm of pets, fear of harm of others, but also fear of the unknown, fear of, you know, what's going to happen next. We know that the socioeconomic status, particularly of women, um, decreases after they leave an abusive relationship or leave a relationship period, but specifically leaving an abusive relationship. And so just not knowing how I'm going to support myself, how am I going to support myself and my children? Fear of not being believed, right? Who's going to believe me, especially, you know, if I am in a relationship with an individual who mm, is uh, high up within community status. So I'll, I'll speak about individuals who perhaps are in a relationship with somebody who's in law enforcement or, you know, is within the criminal justice system or is a priest or a pastor or, you know, high up within a, a, a religious organization. Um, sometimes there's a lot of pressure from the community to remain in a relationship and that can be around um, faith values or even uh, cultural values for uh, family or, or, or community. So sometimes there's also that aspect of love and hope, right? Nobody gets into a relationship with the hope or expectation that it's going to fail. We all hope and expect that our relationships are going to be positive uh, and, and good, right? So especially when we come to understand it, we won't talk about the cycle of violence today, but thinking about the honeymoon phase when all the promises to change or promises that this is never going to happen again exist, there is that hope for the individual. Maybe this really is the end. Maybe they really do mean that it's that they're going to change and this is the last time. And oftentimes the reality is that an individual still loves their partner, right? I may be experiencing abuse by my partner and I still love them. I want the abuse to end, but I still love my partner. And so love and hope, even though they're not on this slide, are also um, really important barriers to be aware of um, for an individual. Many losses associated with leaving, if that's what somebody is considering, or perhaps, again, barriers to potentially leaving a relationship. And that could be connection to their community, right? Uh, it could be, again, dreams for the relationship could be afraid of losing contact with their children. You know, I had attended uh, the session earlier today on family law and, right, our systems are imperfect, right? And so what is the likelihood that my abusive partner is going to have um, access or time with the children in the absence of me? Or what if I am not granted access um, or custody? And I know those aren't the accurate terms anymore, but custody and access of my children. So all of these kind of fears and potential losses when somebody is looking to leave a relationship, which will keep them kind of in, entrenched within that relationship. It's important to understand, and again, if you are working with or you're, you know of somebody who's experiencing abuse in a relationship, that leaving is a process, right? We know uh, through research that on average, again, average, it takes somebody seven tries seven times that somebody will leave a relationship and return to that relationship before they are actually i'm going to kind of use in quotations quote unquote successful in actually um leaving that relationship for good and we also know that uh risk of homicide and relation in abuse happens after somebody has made the decision or has actually left the relationship. So when we talk about leaving being a process and it has to be planned, it's also for these reasons. We really need to be, um, I guess we have to safety plan. We have to be aware of uh, what is happening for that individual in order to plan for that leaving, if that is what the individual's intention is. There we go. Uh, so I've already kind of mentioned this, that uh, we know that risk of homicide increases as after somebody has left the relationship. There are also some other high risk times, such as pregnancy, um, when somebody files for divorce, or even if I've left and now um, going to court around, you know, for family, family law or family legal issues could also see an escalation in uh, abuse at that time. Uh, or also if the abused, the person who is using abuse believes that their partner or ex-partner is in a new relationship, whether it is true uh, or not, um, we can also see an escalation in abuse at that time.
So I am sure that the individuals, uh, those of you who are in the group today, so I'm going in the wrong direction, uh, all have different roles and not knowing who all is in this space. Uh, I'm just put down a couple of things to keep in mind, regardless of your role. And for some of you, if you are a service provider and are able to engage in um, more support, I guess, then certainly keep that in mind. But I've just kind of put these things in that really would be good for anybody who's responding to a disclosure, regardless of your role. First and foremost, one of the best things we can do and what we need to do when somebody discloses that they're experiencing abuse in their relationship is to believe what they are saying, believe their story, believe that what they're saying is true. Secondly, acknowledge the courage that it's taken for them to share their experience with you. Right? And then thirdly, validate. One of the most important things that we can say to somebody is you do not deserve to be treated this way. Right? Validate that experience. And then, Important to understand that regardless of whether you are a, um, a natural support, right, community support or a professional support, it is important to always work with the individual wherever they are at, right? Even though I might have serious concerns about the individual's safety uh, in understanding kind of risk factors and what they're sharing with me, and I'm concerned and I would like to see them leave that relationship, that might not be at all what where they are at in that moment. So not impose on them what you would like to see happen but really there be there to be a source of support for them and again depending on your role being able to connect them to resources and supports in community if that person is wanting to access additional supports and um, resources in the community so depending again on your role but either way being aware of what are some of the resources that are available in your community uh, is really important so that you know where to refer them to All right so that's really what I wanted to give as a high level, um, you know, information and understanding family violence and uh, the different types of abuse, I think, is where I always start. Because, again, there really is a misunderstanding that abuse is limited to physical abuse. And we're really missing the boat and in supporting individuals and helping people to identify um, what they're experiencing as abuse and also to support them through that. So from here, I want to give a little bit of an overview about Project CASA, and then we're going to talk about cultural safety, and I'll share with you a tool that we can utilize, again, to create a culturally safe practice, which, again, is going to be helpful regardless of whether you're working with somebody who's impacted by family violence or not, but certainly can be looked at um, as a tool when you are working with an individual who's impacted by family violence. So CASA, as I mentioned, I work for the Alberta Home Visitation Network Association as a family violence um, specialist. And about six years ago, we partnered with the Indo-Canadian Women's Association. I know Jody uh, gave us opening um, remarks this morning to open up the day today. And we applied for funding through Wage Canada, so Women, Women and Gender Equality Canada, and were successful in receiving funding for CASA, which is culturally appropriate and safe assistance for survivors of violence through home visitation. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on Project CASA, um, other than, you know, I mentioned it was a partnership between Indo-Canadian Women's Association and AVNA. And I'll just put up this um, slide for you, as I just explained very briefly what CASA was. I mentioned earlier that AVNA, the Alberta Home Visitation Network, we have a family violence protocol that I've written and developed for all home visitation programs in the province. And so what CASA allowed us to do was actually to, over a five year period, we did um, interviews and focus groups with individuals across Alberta, um, both people who were had been impacted or had experiences of domestic violence as well as those who were supporting individuals so um, home visitors and, and other service providers but really looking at the existing protocol with a cultural lens uh, so essentially what we were doing with CASA was through the needs assessment we were looking at the existing protocol and how can we adjust or change the existing protocol to be more um, relevant I guess uh, for those who are working with individuals from different cultures. And again, understanding that culture is not just about ethnicity. So um, some of the themes, there were five themes that came out of the needs assessment. And again, I'm not going to spend a lot of uh, time on all of these because I do want to get to some conversation about cultural safety and what is cultural safety and how can we ensure that we are actually creating um, a culturally safe practice um, when we're interacting with folks. So. Uh, you know, cultural safe practice, it is a multi-layered process. 
And what we did within the CASA project, as I've mentioned in here, is that after the needs assessment, there were some recommendations that came out from community, both those who had been impacted by family violence and those who were supporting, um, supporting those individuals. And we went through the entire protocol and made some adjustments. In addition to adjustments to the protocol, we also created a training session, which is creating culturally safe practice in home visitation, which is a two half day uh, virtual session to support the creation of culturally safe practice in home visitation. So I'm going to kind of just shift through these slides here and land here where we will now have a bit of conversation about um, cultural safety. All right. I see there's some new people who have joined us as well. So please feel free to, again, uh, put your comments or questions in the chat if uh, as they come up. Okay, so understanding cultural safety. Here we go. In order to understand cultural safety, I think we first need to start with an understanding of what is culture. So as I mentioned, oftentimes when people hear the word culture, or we talk about culture, people tend to default to thinking that we're talking about ethnicity. And so relating culture to ethnoculture, right, or ethnocultural. And yet when we're talking about culture, it's much, much broader than just ethnicity. So I want to share with you a few definitions of culture. So the first one is a definition that is um, provided to us by Patricia Heddleson, and she suggests that culture is understood as the dynamic and evolving socially constructed socially constructed reality that exists in the minds of social group members. It is the normative glue that allows group members to communicate and work effectively together. Right. And then we can look at Milton Bennett's definition. And Milton Bennett suggests that culture is the learned and shared values, beliefs and behaviors of a group of interacting people. So a couple of thoughts here. Everyone is equally cultural. Okay. Here's the first statement I want to make, right? Everyone is equally cultural. So it's not true that some people have more culture than others, if you will. But sometimes we are unaware of our own culture because it's just how things are. It's just how we live, how we interact, what we do. Uh, and when we aren't necessarily aware of our own culture, we're sometimes also unaware of how it actually shapes our experience, right? So sometimes it's much easier to see, if you will, another person's culture because we suddenly see a difference. So maybe I'll give a quick example of this. Um, but before I give the example, I'm actually going to share with you another one of Milton Bennett's definitions, which is really the definition that I tend to work from the most in talking about culture. And it is very simply put, culture is the way we do things around here. I don't think you can have a simpler definition of culture than that. But when we come to understand that culture is just the way that we do things around here, the way that I do things, then it also helps us understand that everybody has their individual culture, right? So an example perhaps um, would be, I'll, this could, you could see this example either in a lecture hall, um, perhaps at an academic institution, or even in a movie theater, for example, or even on the bus, right? So I go into, I'll use the example of a movie theater. I go into the movie theater, I have a seat, lots of spots and open available um, seats in the movie theater. And somebody walks in and they come and they pick the seat right beside me. And I can tell you that all of a sudden I'm going, mm, why is this person sitting beside me, right? I'm feeling awkward. I might be feeling uncomfortable because for me, that's not the way we do things around here, right? Uh, there's lots of space. So you would typically, I would expect that that person's going to sit elsewhere, but perhaps for their culture, right? That's not the way that they do things, right? Perhaps it actually is about, um, it's an opportunity to connect. If I think about this example within um, an academic institution or an lecture hall, right? Perhaps for that individual, their hope is to meet somebody else who's going to be a part of the lecture. Uh, perhaps it's a way for them to connect, right? Um, interact with a new person, share ideas or learnings that they're going to be having in the class. So important for us to reflect upon culture uh, and our own culture 
because that's what's actually going to help us reflect upon how it shapes our experience and how it also shapes others' experiences. Understanding culture and the broadness of culture is imperative to actually be able to understand cultural safety or to have a culturally safe practice. Couple other things about culture. And of course, I mean, we could have a whole like, you know, half a day session just talking about culture. So this is really just, again, surface, um, you know, the tip of the iceberg. But when we think about culture, it's important to understand that culture is learned. Right? And culture is not static, right? Culture is dynamic. It is always changing. If I think about some of the things around, you know, my culture, what influences my culture, thinking about what are the different groups that I interact with, that can change perhaps, um, I'll give an example of when I become a parent, right? The way that I do things once I'm a parent might actually be very different than the way that I did things before becoming a parent, right? Or if I think about a work culture, right? There might be a different dynamic in where I currently work as opposed to where I worked before, right? So culture is dynamic, it's always changing. And as I've mentioned it, and I'm going to mention it again, everyone has a culture. But in order to really understand how we can interact with one another, we have to understand our own culture. It helps us to actually understand that when we, when we have this understanding that everybody has a culture, right? Everyone is equally cultural, if you will, then we can also start to view and understand that every interaction that we have is an intercultural interaction. Because culture, again, it's not about ethnicity, uh, differences in race, right? That may be one aspect of it. But when we understand that everybody has their own individual culture, the way that we do things, we understand that every interaction we have is intercultural. Okay. So let me now um, talk a bit about cultural safety. Okay. So I've already mentioned that in order to actually understand cultural safety, Right? or to have or create cultural safety or culturally safe practice, we have to understand culture and this definition of culture as being quite broad. But in addition to that, we also need to understand power and the concepts of power. So in my 90 minute session today, I don't have time to really dive into power, power dynamics and the power dynamics that exist within the context of, I'll talk about, um, you know, a service provider, uh, relationship, service provider, client, whatever your role is, um, but the power dynamics that exist really in all, all interactions that we have. And again, in order to understand cultural safety, to have a culturally safe practice or to create culturally safe spaces, we have to understand power. So I'm going to leave that there. And if you're interested in having more conversations about that, I'll give you some opportunities to engage um, at a later date. So cultural safety re-examines power. We have to understand power and the um, unconscious perhaps sometimes, but the perception of power because the individual that we're working with also has their own perception of power, whether accurate or not, right? But that perception of power and how it can actually impact the interactions that we're having with individuals and the interactions that we're having with our clients. Cultural safety needs to be learned in order to create safe spaces, right? This isn't something that just arbitrarily happens. It actually is something that we need to learn. It's a concept we need to learn and one that we need to implement. On that note, I will say that I can understand um, how to create a culturally safe space and think that I'm doing a great job, but it is only the individual that I'm interacting with that can actually determine or say that I was successful. I mean, like successful, in, right? That that person really was able to create a safe space. I felt culturally safe with that person. I can't say, oh, like pat on the back, rah, rah. I did such a good job today creating culturally safe space. Yeah. All I can do is what I have in my power and control, which is to engage and to utilize the tools that I have, which I'm going to talk a bit more about those, but checking my bias, being aware of my assumptions, being aware of, um, you know, the impact of power, the perceptions of power, right? But it is the individual themselves and only them that is actually able to say whether or not I was able to create that safe, safe space, um, that culturally safety uh, in that session or in that interaction. So cultural safety is a process. It's not just knowledge or awareness of cultural differences or concepts. It is not cultural competency, okay? So 
you know, many years ago, I'm going to say maybe five, seven years ago, there was suddenly this really big push about everybody needs to take cultural competency training, right? So I'm not going to say that's a bad thing. But I think one of the risks with cultural competency is that cultural competency doesn't uh, account for all the differences that exist within a cultural group, if you will, right? Because I can say, well, I need to learn about, you know, South Asian culture, and I need to learn about, you know, because I can talk about ethnicity, I can talk about faith, I need to learn about um, Muslims, and I need to learn about Sikhs, and I need to learn about um, the Jewish community, and I, right? Okay, but that doesn't account for all the differences that can exist within those communities. These are not homogenous groups. So cultural competency, sure, might be important for me to understand, you know, the impact of making eye contact or not making eye contact with certain groups. But we need to understand that it's much broader than that, right? So when we talk about cultural sensitivity or creating a culturally safe space, I don't necessarily need to get it right around that cultural competency every single time, which is, by the way, impossible from my perspective. Um, but if I am applying a culturally, you know, cultural safety tools, right, approach, I don't need to be an expert around cultural competency. And then the last one here is that this process takes time and commitment and practice, right? This isn't just an automatic thing. And some days, depending on how I'm able to show up and what's happening for me, some days I'm going to be more successful than others. And that's just the reality and that's okay. And so I think that in all of these things that we do around learning, that take learning and unlearning and change, um, right? We need to be kind and gentle with ourselves right? Because we are all human beings and sometimes we're going to get it right and sometimes we're not and that's okay um, as long as we can learn from that and again try and do better next time around. So I would like to share with you um, an actual definition first of all of cultural safety and then uh, we'll take a look at a tool that we can utilize in our interactions. First, I'll share with you, when I was looking up definitions around what is a culturally safe practice, there are many that exist out there, and many of them are very, very much rooted in academia, um, academic um, language, and, and yet we do know, right, consistency around all of them, and we know that the origins of cultural safety or culturally safe practice is actually from the Maori nursing, nurses, um, uh, the Maori people in New Zealand. So I, I want to just kind of credit that insofar as where this concept originated. This is the definition that I land for land with. Um, it feels very approachable for me. And so I will read through it and I'll just give a few of my, my thoughts and insights here. So when we take about a, talk about a culturally safe practice, this is a respectful engagement that recognizes and strives to address power and discrimination where people feel emotionally and physically safe. You establish trust by reinforcing that each person's knowledge and reality is valid and valuable. You recognize their strengths along with their needs and challenges. You also can recognize your own cultural lens and the power you consciously or unconsciously carry in interactions. There are so many layers in this definition of understanding a culturally safe practice, right? Kind of the very first part, one of the things that stands out for me, well, there's a number, but one is that we're talking about an individual's emotional safety as well as their physical safety, right? Both of those are addressed when we're creating a culturally safe space. And as I've already mentioned many times, and I'll probably mention many times yet going forward, is that we have to understand power and address power if we're able to create a culturally safe space. And discrimination also plays a part in here. So in um, the training that I offer that looks at creating a culturally safe um, practice in home visitation, or just generally speaking, uh, we spend a lot of time unpacking the un and understanding terms like bias, uh, discrimination, stereotyping. We go through the ladder of discrimination. So, you know, again, not time for us to do that here today in our 90 minutes, but it's really important to understand these concepts, if you will. Oftentimes these words that we use interchangeably, but don't really, you know, do a deep dive to understand 
How are they related? How are they different? And what do they actually mean in our interactions with others? And then when I look at the second aspect, right, this is really talking about working from a strengths-based approach where I'm recognizing that every individual that I interact with, every individual that I'm working with comes with their own strengths, right? A, a basic best practice rule of thumb is that every, you know, I'm going to speak about it in client, but every client that I work with, they are the expert in their own lives, right? I can come with my ideas and tools and expertise and skills that I've gained along the way, but I need to recognize their strengths, right? The knowledge that they have and every person's reality is valid and valuable. This third piece of the definition is also critical. And it's the one that I've kind of was speaking to earlier is that we actually have to have a good understanding of our own cultural lens if we're going to be able to create a culturally safe space. If I am not aware of my own cultural lens, if I'm not aware of how my culture, the way that I do things and how that impacts my interactions with others, I am not going to be able to create a culturally safe space. Right? So when we talk about cultural safety, it is as much about knowing myself, right? About self-reflection than it is actually about knowing the story of the client or the individual that I'm supporting, right? And again, we're seeing the concept of power reiterated here. Um, so I recognize my own cultural lens, but in addition to that, the power that I consciously or unconsciously carry in the interactions that I have. So at the beginning of our time together, I promised that I would be introducing a tool that you could take away. I want to mention, first of all, that this tool was actually um, uh, created and, and shared with, with me and also that I used in my other training by the Multicultural Health Brokers here in Edmonton. And so we call it the SEDEF tool. And, you know, again, this is just going to be a very brief introduction to the tool just um, because our time together is fairly limited. Uh, and I also want to leave a bit of time for questions. But when we look at this tool, the first thing I'm going to say is that this is a thinking tool. So, you know, if you're the kind of person who wants a tool that has like questions and check boxes and, and, you know, scores, right? That's not what this is. This really is a reflective tool. And it actually is a tool about reflection about myself, right? So it's a tool that I want to use to look at how I'm interacting, perhaps the assumptions that I'm making, how my own culture, my own cultural lens is impacting the interaction that I'm having with others. But it's actually about looking internally and reflecting upon myself. So I'll kind of run through the tool and then maybe I'll, I'll give an example of how this tool could be utilized. Um, and then from there, I'll share a little bit about kind of where we could go from here if anybody's interested in more information. And then I'll open up um, the room for some questions. So when I look at this tool, the very first step is to clarify. So I'm thinking about an interaction or an incident that occurred that I saw or an interaction that I ha had with, it could be a client, um, or this tool can really be utilized in any interaction. So it could be with a client, it could be with a friend, it could be with a colleague. Okay? So in clarify, I really just simply wanna look at what are the objective elements of the situation? So what has happened? So clarify is really, very, I'm going to say strictly, uh, facts, facts about what has happened, right? I'm not giving my opinion. I'm not making assumptions. It's not about what I think. Uh, I'm not talking about, you know, what the client is feeling. I am just simply stating what is happening, right? What's happening in the situation. And then I want to want to be able to identify what am I feeling? What am I feeling in this situation? And then once I'm able to kind of lay out, right, what's happening, the facts of the situation, I want to go into the next step, which is deepen. Now, oftentimes when we utilize its tool, it's because there's something, there's some niggly, right? There's something that's not quite, I'm not feeling great about, right? And so the first question is, is based on that assumption that that's typically when we're utilizing this tool, but it might be rooted in, you know, why am I feeling this way about the interaction? Why am I feeling this way about the situation, right? Why does this bother me? And then I think about, you know, maybe what am I expecting? What was I expecting that maybe isn't actually what happened and might be impacting how I'm thinking about it? What am I tempted to conclude in this situation? What am I assuming? What assumptions am I making? And this might also help us to identify 
some biases that we have, right? So what am I assuming? And then how do I know that the assumptions are valid or that they are true? And I can tell you that when we go into the deepened tool and that get to the end of how do I know that these assumptions are valid? The reality is that we don't. The answer there is I don't. <laughs> it's pretty much always I don't know if they are valid, right? So then once I've taken a look at how I'm feeling, right, the objective elements of the situation, how I'm feeling, why, why am I feeling this way, right? What assumptions am I making? I then want to go to expand. And the thing with expand, this is a tool that you can utilize on your own, but it's a tool that is ideal. And it's great if you can also utilize it with somebody else who's been trained to kind of understand how the tool works because we are limited by our own biases. We're limited by the lens that we have. And so expand really is kind of an invitation, if you will, to try and broaden my perspective. So going back to thinking about the assumptions that I've made. So if it's possible that these assumptions are not true, what might be some alternate explanations? What else could actually be happening? Hmm? I don't know if any of you are familiar with the cultural iceberg, but that's where it says probe below the water level. That's what it's referring to. So what might be some other things to consider, right? Different than the assumptions that I've already made. Is there somebody else that I can consult with? Um, you know, if, if it's in a work situation, if I think, is there a colleague, is there somebody else that I can interact with or ask about, you know, here's kind of the assumptions that I made. Here's what I think is going on. What do you think? What do you think this might be about? Because their lens is going to be different than mine, right? We are limited by our own perspectives, by our own cultural realities, by our cultural lens, right? And then after that, if I move into the forward, forward is when I'm going to take a look at, okay, what can I do now moving forward? So if, again, if this is a client or somebody that I'm going to have ongoing interactions with, what can I do the next time I, I interact with this individual? Or if I'm not going to see that individual again, I can then reflect upon what would I do in the future if I'm in a similar situation, right? So I'll kind of run through an example of a situation perhaps that this can be utilized in, and I'll use it, um, I'll give an example around with a family violence lens, okay? So in the example that I'm going to give, the interaction that happened is, uh, so I was working with a family, had recently started working with the family. And um, I had gone and met with the mom, so so the wife, and we had had some really good conversations. Um, she was in, engaged. Uh, she was quite interactive. Uh, and we had started to develop a fairly positive and a good rapport in working together. And it was maybe the third or fourth session I went uh, to meet with her and her husband was present. Okay? And the objective elements of the situation, so this is what I'm saying, right? We had, you know, uh, she was quite interactive, uh, you know, forthcoming, engaged with me. And what happened is on the next session I arrived, the husband was present and her behavior changed. Uh, she was very quiet, um, was not very interactive. Um, and yeah, and, and her behavior had changed and her engagement with me changed. So what was I feeling? I was, uh, I'll tell you, I was feeling uncomfortable. Again, my lens, I, I've worked in the family violence sector for over 10 years. Um, the bulk of my, my work has been with supporting and interacting with individuals who are impacted by family violence. And so what was I feeling? I was feeling concerned um, and curious, but I was feeling curious and concerned because there was such a shift in her behavior. So then if I go into deepen and I think, you know, why was this bothering me? Well, it was bothering me because in my experience, again, thinking with a family violence land was bothering me because I was wondering and thinking maybe this was rooted in power and control. Maybe she felt that she didn't feel safe when her husband was present to actually be able to speak freely and to engage as she had been before. Because what I was expecting was that even though her husband was present, she was still going to be engaged on that visit when I went to engage with her, right? That she was going to be interactive and, and as engaged, perhaps if not as engaged, but still quite engaged, even if her husband was present. So what was I tempted to conclude? I was tempted to conclude that maybe there was power and control in that relationship, that there was other abuse happening, that she wasn't feeling safe, right? So how did I know that those assumptions were valid? I didn't. 
Okay, so now if I move on to the next section and I look then at expand, is it possible that these assumptions are not true? Absolutely. So if I'm now thinking, okay, maybe it's not actually something concerning, right? What might be some alternate explanations or considerations? So if I reflect back, right, this, this change in behavior, what could it be about that is not, you know, the assumption that I originally made? And I'm not saying that my assumption was wrong, right? Because maybe it was right, but it's that, is that rooted in a bias, right? Or, right, uh, my own cultural lens. So what might be some other alternate explanations? Well, maybe she wasn't feeling well, right? Maybe literally she was under the weather, or ill, wasn't feeling well. And so therefore her demeanor had changed. She was less engaged. She had low energy, right? Maybe it was just around her health. Um, maybe the reality was so the her husband also worked out of town. Okay. And so he was only able to actually engage in our sessions every third or fourth session. So maybe it was because she thought we had already had an opportunity to have rapport and develop a relationship that she thought, even though, you know, she could easily have just kind of quote unquote taken over the session or shared, she thought, you know what, I'm just going to take a step back because I want my husband to actually be able to um, share, right? And engage and build a rapport. Okay. Maybe it was just the expectation of the dynamic of that relationship. Maybe it wasn't that she wasn't feeling safe. Okay. Is there somebody else that I could have consulted with, right? I had a colleague or a, or perhaps um, a partner agency that had worked wherever maybe that referral came from that could have gone and said, hey, have you had this experience? Is, did this happen with you as well when you worked with them? So then moving forward, you know, what can I do now? Well, knowing that I'm going to be working with her again, what might I be able to do? Well, again, with a family violence lens, and this might depend on, you know, your role. But for myself in this situation, I'm going to go back and probably do a reactive screen. Or I will have a conversation with her and simply say, hey, I noticed, right? I noticed last time that I came, right? it was the first time that your husband was present. And I noticed that your, your you know, your behavior had changed, right? Usually you're really engaging and, you know, we have some great conversations, but I noticed that when he was there, you were really quiet. Uh, and I was wondering what that's about. Give her an opportunity, right? So literally I'm checking in with her and um, in part, I may also be doing a reactive screen to find out, is this actually about power and control? Is there other types of abuse that are happening in the relationship? Or is it maybe something that I haven't even thought of or one of these other examples of considerations of alternate explanations that I had um, found out about? So that's one example, right? So just to take you through the tool. And as you can see, when we're using this tool in creating a culturally safe space, once again, it's not about the client because this entire tool was about myself and thinking about how am I feeling about it? Why am I feeling this way about it, right? What assumptions am I making? How could this be different? And then what am I going to do? It's not about, ooh, I think I need to connect this client to, you know, other people in the community because, you know, for when her husband's away, or it's not about making assumptions about what I think the client needs. It's actually all about myself, right? Because as I mentioned earlier, cultural safety, we actually have to know about ourselves. It's very much around self-reflection. And that's also what this tool is about. It's an invitation for us to reflect, to be able to identify or be aware of the biases that we hold, that we bring forward, that impact the assumptions that we make and the interactions that we have. Right. So that's the tool that I'd like to present. And I mentioned that I would share a couple of additional um, opportunities for further learning. Uh, so I did put the link to the AVNA website, which is the Alberta Home Visitation Network Association, uh, the organization where I work as their family violence specialist. And um, you have an opportunity to go there under the training tab. There's the family violence training that I provide. It's actually a two day training. Uh, there's a two day in person, or there's also a, an online virtual version. I also uh, co-facilitate uh, with Saima Tanvir uh, cultural safety training, which is around creating a culturally safe practice. And that one is a two half day. 
And if you're interested in connecting with me, I put my email there, which is Avna FV as an Avna Family Violence at gmail.com. And as I mentioned earlier, if there's anything that I've talked about or resources that I mentioned that you're interested in knowing more information about, please feel free to uh, reach out and um, connect. I'm just peeking in the chat here. Now, I did, um, I had intended to leave uh, some time for questions. So we have about 15 minutes left. Um, Oh, there we go. We have about 15 minutes left in our time together. So I just wanted to open it up and see if anybody has any questions or if there's any area that you would like me to expand on or share a little bit more information about. Just taking a look at the... Yeah, so I'm just reading Colette's comments here in the chat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so lots of different thoughts here, Colette, and absolutely. I would say there is a lack of awareness when it comes to disability abuse. Uh, I mean, generally speaking within society, there's a lack of awareness, a lack of awareness of about what abuse actually looks like um, beyond physical abuse, but definitely even more so when we think about um, kind of our more vulnerable populations. And I'll talk about uh, specifically, yeah, the disability you know, community, uh, as well as our queer community, and also elder abuse when I think about, you know, seniors abuse. And, and so the vulnerability, uh, the additional vulnerabilities of these particular groups and we definitely need more, more awareness and more edu education specifically around those um, individuals and in our more vulnerable populations. Uh, the other thing that you had mentioned that I wanted to talk about. Oh, right. You mentioned another tactic is forcing the person on social assistance to use their entire check for rent and refuse to buy food um, for the disabled person and even children. Absolutely. I've also seen that even around, and I, this could be under our, our umbrella of sexual abuse, where somebody is not allowed access to birth control or where an individual say, right, um, they, their abusive partner always wanted them to be pregnant or we're seeing a more children, they wanting to have more children so that they have access to child support benefits, right? And again, using then around financial abuse, um, using that, that uh, money in, within that aspect of full control of the finances in, this, in the relationship. Yes, thank you for those, that information. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. Absolutely, or the opposite, forced abortion. For sure. Many of the, the examples, right, is, is there's there's two sides to that, right? Either not allowing somebody to access birth control, forcing somebody to um, be pregnant or, right, um, forcing forced abortion, right, all of these, these components. And, you know, if we look at the impact of domestic violence on children or on pregnant mom, right, there's a whole other aspect around that. Um, forced abortion, and of course we know that uh, you know, there has to be consent for abortion. But again, when we talk about voluntary consent, right, it definitely can be involuntary consent. I'll also mention around that, uh, just for pregnancy, we know that pregnancy is a high risk time for women. In the family violence protocol that I developed, it includes a pregnancy screen, because we know that pregnancy being at high, high risk time for women, oftentimes we see an escalation in abuse uh, during pregnancy. And we also can see the um, um, the onset of physical abuse in during pregnancy prior to an, an absence of physical abuse prior to pregnancy. Uh, so there's many additional aspects when we talk about pregnancy of the loss of control, um, pregnant women who are not allowed to access prenatal care. Um, and then again, with the potential increase or introduction of physical abuse or escalation of physical abuse, uh, direct harm to the fetus um, and babies being born with actual physical injuries um, due to the physical abuse that mom had uh, been subjected to during pregnancy. Okay. 
Anybody else? I had mentioned that I was going to put a couple of resources um, in the chat. Uh, I'll see if I can just pull up the link. SOAR um, in British Columbia is the one of them. So the SOAR project is um, the one that I was referencing around uh, traumatic brain injury. So TBI as it relates specifically to intimate partner violence. And then the other one that I mentioned is this one, which is um, outside of the shadows, uh, which is um, specifically on stalking. And there's a video there and some additional resources as well that you might want to take a look at. All right, so we do, uh, as I said, I've left the, these 10 minutes for questions, but if there aren't any questions, then of course I'll just, uh, you know, you're, you're welcome to sign off and you've just gained an extra 10 minutes in your day. Uh, and once again, please feel free to email me uh, if you're wanting to have any additional information about any of the things that I have mentioned. And my email, once again, is avnafv, as in avnafamilyviolence, uh, at gmail.com. And Avna being the Alberta Home Visitation Network Association, uh, the organization for whom I work. So thank you all for being here today. I appreciate your attention and interest to on this topic, and I I hope that uh, you'll reach out if you're you're wanting to further engage um, or have more conversations. <laughs>